We, Sonia and Januni, are a couple of pals studying science in undergrad. We are not professionals. Though every episode is meticulously researched, mistakes do happen. If you notice that anything, and we mean anything, we state is inaccurate, please let us know. Your comments, suggestions, and queries are important in furthering our personal and audience's understanding of science. Thanks for being a part of this discussion. We appreciate you. We really do. Bop, bop. Beep, bop, bop. Hello everyone, I'm Sonia. And I'm Januni. And welcome back to another episode of Beaker Bros. I literally forgot. <laughs> when we drink out of bros because we're beakers. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Say that again. God. It's okay. It's okay. We're good. We're good. That's so funny. Because <laughs> we're beakers. It just reminds me of the time I was calling my insurance company and they, I was telling my postal code and it's like 7v7. They're like B or V. I'm like, yeah, B as in, I was going to say B as in vagina. And I couldn't think of any other words. <laughs> I was like, B as in B. <laughs> like Victoria. Oh my God. That's so funny. Well, anyways, do you want to try saying it again? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you want to do the whole thing again? So. It's easier for you. I'm not going to lie. I was going to keep that part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where we drink out of beakers. Because we're because pros. We're pros. <laughs> Anyways, Januni, how are you doing? How, I'm sure after that intro, I can tell you're a little distraught. I'm okay. I'm. My brain is confused. My mouth is confused. But this will be a great episode. I'm, you know what? I like the confidence. Thank you. And, yep. This is going to be a particularly interesting one because we are going to be talking about drum roll, <laughs> HPV and cervical cancer. And just, I guess, as a little bit of an introduction to what HPV is and cervical cancer, I'm just going to give a brief overview. Then Januni is going to take it away with uh, more of the info. But, anyways. So in 1976, a dude named Dr. Harold Hausen discovered that patients that were um, infected with uh, the human papilloma virus, or HPV for short, are at a higher risk of developing cervical cancer. And discoveries that happened later on actually ended up paving the way uh, for developing cervical cancer screening tests and vaccines that identify and prevent cervical tumors. And despite significant advancements, um, disparities infecting socioeconomic status, access to care and healthcare in general, and education continue to perpetuate incidences of HPV infection and cervical cancer, not just here in Canada, but worldwide. So in acknowledgement of the disparities that, severely, that are severely faced by those in particularly low-income countries, or LICs for short, we just want to keep it simple, Compared to high-income countries, or HICs for short, um, our podcast today will discuss the etiology of HPV infection and cervical cancer. So basically, like, it's, excuse me, its origins and how it manifests. And then we're also going to chat a little bit about the challenges of implementing identification and prevention strategies, as well as monitor, monitoring morbidity and mortality. So like, death, I guess, caused by um, HPV and cervical cancer in low-income countries. Yeah, so basically with this episode, it's kind of a shout out to all our cisgender females and our transgender men. Yeah, because it's like, yeah, it's not something that just happens to cisgendered um, women. Yeah. That's yeah. something that's often overlooked. But anyways, do you, you want to talk about the etiology? Yeah. So the HPV is a non-enveloped double-stranded DNA virus primarily transmitted through sexual contact. So once HPV invest, infects its host, precancerous properties can develop causing um, cervical cancer or cervical tumors. So in 90% of infected individuals, HPV infections are asymptomatic and can resolve within 12 to 24 months. Can you talk or about, real, sorry, real quick, what's asymptomatic just for our audience? No symptoms. There we go. Cool. Like, Continue. you know, your asymptomatic COVID, asymptomatic HPV. Very cool. <clears throat> anyway, so in patients actually with severe infections, this can develop into cervical cancer that we know. 
approximately 99.7 percent i love how i said approximately like <laughs> like it could be 99.7452 whatever <laughs> But 99.7% of all cervical cancer cases originate from HPV. So there's approximately 177 HPV subtypes, but HPV 16 and 18 cause approximately 70% of the cases. Interesting. Hmm. Oh, sorry. I just said interesting. Interesting. So HPV infections typically take 10 to 20 years to manifest into tumors. But, ah, this is... (laughs) This long manifestation period uh, provides ample time to screen and provide treatment using surgery and radiotherapy. Uh, Using modern technology, cervical cancer diagnosis are no longer a death sentence, which is a good thing. So Mm -hmm. a win for us. Uh, In fact, patients treated for precancerous lesions shortly after early screening have nearly 100% survival rate. Five years post-treatment. That's why it's important. Important. (laughs) important to get your um pap smears and stuff like that which we'll be talking a little bit later on yes and so real quick sorry why did you just go like oh (laughs) like halfway through huh oh it sounded like you oh were you just inhaling at that point then maybe you were but it sounded like for a second you had like an epiphany about something i might have (laughs) but like the moment's gone so it's gone i don't even know what i was gonna say um The advent of HPV vaccination also represents a monumental moment in cervical cancer prevention history. So there's a Dr. Harold Housen. Housen. And the dude in 2003, I think it was, that made the first vaccine or sometime in like early 2000s. I think they, I know Dr. Harold Housen, he won Mm -hmm. a Nobel Prize for his discovery. Yeah. I don't know if the vaccine dude did because it was based off of like a lot of the research from previous people but anyway uh, that's an aside okay that's pretty cool though yeah um there's different vaccines though there's like a bivalent a quadrivalent and a non-valent vaccines and these are licensed in over 100 countries and are nearly 100 percent effective in preventing cervical cancers caused by hpv that's so cool. yes but that is interesting <laughs> yeah because like it's not necessarily like there's no such thing necessarily as like a a vaccine that prevents cancer but yeah. by pre- but by preventing hpv you are pretty much preventing that cancer from manifesting so this is kind of like an anti-cancer vaccine it's like indirectly yeah That's yeah cool. i really love science i love science heck yeah <laughs> excited so there's a two-dose series that can get administered six to 12 months apart which is re- recommended for um, those younger than 15 years of age but there's also a three-year three-dose series administered two and six months respect respect why can i not say that word respectively after their previous dose is recommended for those above 15 years of age i don't know if you remember this but when i was in grade eight so what like 13 or 14 we got the kapow um twice i think yeah yeah but i remember i got it done at my school so ours was a two dose one because we were under the age of 15 yeah mm-hmm. yeah and there's a lot of reflection into our, our labs yeah uh but yeah so that's a little fun fact about the vaccines what hpv is and all the fun the science stuff that has brought us to where we are today and it has allowed us to talk to you guys about all this fun stuff very cool Januni. thank you for sharing that <laughs> and anyways i guess now to talk about like how hpv and cervical cancer have been addressed firstly in high-income countries so arguably no country has been more successful in reducing incidences of hpv infection and cervical cancer than australia actually so Obviously, there have been like other countries that have made a lot of headway, but yeah. one of the most prominent examples worldwide is considered to be Australia. The kangaroos. The kangaroos and the koalas. Yeah, and the shrimp on the Barbie. Haha. Uh-huh. Anyways, so since 2007, uh, the Australian government has instituted free vaccines uh, for HPV through school-based programs and provides access to cervical cancer screenings at little to no cost, which is awesome. 
and this these screenings begin um, every five years beginning at age 25 but this is just for like the program that's in Australia it's not like necessarily representative of different healthcare policy like I know in Canada we have like a different implementation strategy compared to other countries um but anyways just continuing on mm -hmm. uh in Australia as well, there's also a national cervical cancer registry that monitors morbidity, mortality, prevention, and treatment outcomes. Um, that was also introduced um, near the end of like the 2000s or like 2010 era. Mm -hmm. And um, through implementing these resources, incidences of HPV infection and cervical cancer in Australia has actually declined from 18 per 100,000 in 1991 to just six per 100,000 in 2014. Wow. So in, by 2028, Australia is actually expected to reduce incidences of HPV and cervical cancer to below four per 100,000. Wow. And, yeah, and according to World Health Organization standards, this would mean that cervical cancer would effectively be declared eliminated from a population for the first time in history. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, because of all these cool things. That's really awesome. Like what, seven more years then? Seven more years is expected. Maybe earlier, maybe a little mm -hmm. later. We'll see how progress continues to go. Yeah. But yeah, that this information is based from um, a nature uh, publication that was from 2020. So oh. perhaps it's changed a little bit over the past yeah. few months since when the, or like more than a few months actually, since this um, article was published. But yeah. from when this article was published, that's what their projections are. But yeah, anyways, so Australia and other HICs or high income countries are undoubtedly on course to achieving the World Health Organization cervical cancer elimination benchmark. However, it would be rather ignorant um, or we would be rather remiss, I guess, to ignore the monumental disparities affecting healthcare services in um, underserved, uninsured and underrepresented communities, not just in Australia, but globally but again since we're talking about Australia right now um, critics argue that pre-existing healthcare infrastructure provides a really broad um, diagnosis and therapy options in the country but uh, the opportunity to receive these treatments are not proportionally distributed throughout its population so if we want to like reference back to one of the episodes that we did about healthcare disparities if you want more information on like what that is you can check that episode out but um, just like a, as a brief overview for like this context, uh, this disproportionately can be seen using um, a study by Johnson and colleagues modeling system. So through initially analyzing HPV transmission and vaccine coverage in England, <clears throat> excuse me, a widening disparity gap in strip cancer incidences between um, white and ethnic minorities has been observed in many high income countries like Australia. And for this reason, incidences of cervical cancer morbidity and mortality in Australia are nearly triple among, amongst Aboriginal women and women of color. So, Ooh. and yeah, that's like, that's a huge disparity between, you know, <sighs> like we're looking at these incidences or projections saying that like it's gonna be eliminated by, you know, such and such year. Mm -hmm. But that does not negate the fact that women of color and um, Aboriginal or Indigenous descent are not being taken care of in the same way as their, like, white counterparts. Yeah. But, yeah, anyways, just to wrap yeah. this up, though. Additionally, there's also countries like the United States with uh, privatized healthcare systems, <sighs> which, yeah, that's <laughs> another conversation for another time. But these systems restrict low-income individuals from accessing HPV screening tests and vaccines. And the added cost of these services coupled with improper efficacy, I'm getting, I'm <laughs> stuttering here, but let me restate that sentence. So the added cost of these services coupled with improper efficacy education has also exacerbated HPV vaccine hesitancy and incidences of cervical cancer, again, not just in the United States mm -hmm. or Canada, but worldwide. Damn. Yeah, I was just gonna like add to it, like the whole like 
how improper like education or whatever has exasperated like HPV vaccine hesitancy. It's like that with like most vaccines and stuff, at least like with the current state of vaccines, especially yeah. with the COVID vaccine, I was going to say like not being well educated or if there was a cost associated with it mm-hmm. that causes the disparity. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say like all this stuff by not providing access it just re- decreases people's trust in healthcare providers and all that kind of stuff so yeah it just makes health worse overall for the country and worldwide it does so Sonia was talking about like high income countries hic mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> um i'm gonna go into the low income countries so the lic's so these circumstances, what Sonia mentioned, was actually pretty similar to those that we see in the low income countries. Um, however, rather than impacting segments of the country's population, HPV and cervical cancer prevention is often a national crisis. So it's oh. even worse. Goddamn. <sighs> the who? <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> the who? <laughs> the World Health Organization estimates that 570,000 annually reported cervical cancer cases, so nearly 88% of the diagnosis and deaths occur in low- and mid-income countries. Damn. Whoa. Yep. 88%. Um, And this is largely because of the inadequate access to HPV screenings and vaccines, funding, and education. So in Latin America, the Caribbean, Sub-Saharan, Africa, and Southeast Asia, uh, less than 5% 5% of women have been screened for cervical cancer in the past five years. Holy crap. Less than 5%. Holy crap. <laughs> but, and like that explains the 88%. Mm-hmm. So in instances where screenings are available, but left unused, distrust in the government is often an attributing factor. So similar to the sentiments um, during the previous tetanus immunization campaigns, HPV screenings and vaccinations can be misunderstood as a way to control women and their fertility, which is, you know, it's a fair. Oppressive. Yeah. Yeah. Oppressive. I'm laughing, but it's not. <laughs> it's not funny. Yeah, it's not. Um, additionally, aside from the lacking access to funding, health inf- infrastructure and trained healthcare workers who can administer screenings, social customs often place women in situations that encourage HPV transmission. That's that. so, sorry, if I could just inter- interrupt no, real quick. Fine. Like, imagine feeling so degraded by like systems that are supposed to help you that you would rather like jeopardize your care just because mm-hmm. of like, or not just because, but yeah, rather because you felt or have been so heavily oppressed by that system. Does that make yeah. sense? No, it does make sense that like yeah. they, because of the way they're feeling mm-hmm. and have been treated. Yes. They, oh, sorry. Finish your thought. No, go for it. Go for it. No, no, no it's your I thought. I feel like you have a better way of putting this. Cause I'm like struggling to put this in words. I'm so like, sorry. I get, I get it. Cause I'm just like, okay, it makes sense for them to be like, yeah, why would I trust the government that has treated me and oppressed me mm-hmm. in this way? Yeah. And they're yeah. choosing to like such a life-saving screening and these tests that they could do, they're choosing not to do because mm-hmm. of all of this. And it's, you know, it's valid. Yeah. Be- like their fears and concerns are valid. It's not based on, you know, something that they made up in their head. It's based on historical precedents. Yeah. It's an injustice. <laughs> it is. It really is. Um, but so with the effects of these disparities on cervical cancer morbidity and mortality are low in high income countries. However, child marriage, polygamy, and dis significantly influence cervical cancer incidences in low-income uh, countries like Malawi. Here, cervical cancer morbidity stands at 75.9 per 100,000 and mortality at 49.8 per 100,000. So, That's a whole lot. Yeah, so just going back to how we were saying before that in Australia, it's expected to be four per 100,000. Yeah. This is like close to 20 times <laughs> Yeah. Higher. <laughs> like, a whole lot. That's a lot of people dying unnecessarily. Yeah. 
and just because they're in a low-income country. Yeah, exactly. But I guess just to add on to this conversation about it, like despite the fact of having nearly 100% efficacy, uh, the simply the unaffordability of vaccines severely limits the ability for them to be used in these areas. So we can ramble about the fact that like, you know, if they just had access to these vaccines mm-hmm. or screening tests, like there wouldn't be like, it wouldn't be that high. But yeah, the fact of the matter is it's just so unaffordable for these countries. And Damn. particularly though, in nations that are like riddled with poverty, civil war, famine, um, simply paying, well, not to say simply, but for to pay more than $100 per dose of the vaccine is literally impossible. And like even here, like if someone said you had to pay $100 for a vaccine, mm-hmm. not everyone's going to be like, okay with that. Yeah. Like imagine charging for the COVID vaccine. Damn. Like people wouldn't have, I mean, like obviously the incentive to get it would be the fact that like you would be like, you would have immunity against the COVID virus, yeah. but like, I guess like like that's what poverty does to you. You, you can't, like you can't afford it. At that point, it's like you want food on the table, or do you want to like a potential thing, something? It's not even a definite like you'll get it kind of thing for them in their head. Mm-hmm. Like do you want to spend a hundred dollars on something you could potentially get, yeah, or rather have food on the table. So yeah, but yeah, that's totally true. And for HPV vaccines to become widely available. A lot of uh, low-income countries with a gross domestic product of less than $1,000 per capita have to be able to purchase and distribute these vaccines for less than $2 a dose. So 50 times less, not just to purchase the vaccine, but distribute it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Because, yeah, like, imagine, like, I don't know much about the logistics of distributing COVID-19 vaccines or, like, new vaccine in general, but I'm sure, like, the cost of that must be substantial yeah so yeah so yeah that's that's what it that's what um a lot of ngos and not just ngos but governments like predict about what the cost needs to be but in addition to like logistical barriers in funding and implementing nationwide screening and vaccine programs excuse me i just burped but in addition to that, educating communities to regularly utilize these resources poses a lot of like significant hurdles. Um, one notable case study, I guess, going back to Malawi, like Janouni mentioned before, um, is Malawi's first attempt to introduce a sort of comprehensive na- nationwide screening program. So in a 2015 study, researchers initially hoped to target about 80% of its eligible population uh, to like give the vaccine. However, they were only successful in, or not just the vaccine, but like screenings more specifically. Mm-hmm. But however, they were only successful in screening about 30% of the population. And there was even a lesser amount of success was achieved in following up with these uh, or rather following up with those who tested positive for HPV infection. And Mm. Colombia being another example also encountered similar outcomes with their most recent uh, prevention program, because in addition to poor screening and follow-up outcomes, women reported being hesitant and uncomfortable to receive vaccinations and cervical screenings. Mm -hmm. So yeah, collectively these studies show that simply offering regular screenings and vaccines is not enough, clearly. You just sneezed, what dab? Sorry. <laughs> Going back on topic, it's um, implementing innovative outreach and education strategies, particularly in low income countries, is absolutely necessary because, or not rather because, but uh, I'm stuttering. But it is nations, necessary. Yeah. Yeah. But some eight, eh, I almost said something else, but some nations have already started doing this, though, which is pretty good. So, for example, In impoverished regions of Thailand, where the threat of cervical cancer is really amplified by the fact that, like, there's no one in isolated regions, healthcare workers are actually sent to these remote communities to offer screenings through mobile centers. So radios, megaphones, and church calls are also used to encourage hard-to-reach women to attend these screenings, 
like literally just yelling saying like we got cervical cancer screening programs they're gonna say we have cervical cancer I was like why would they yell that okay yeah the screenings okay yeah yeah and um in areas of east africa as well where cervical examination facilities and women are, are rather female um healthcare workers are limited self-sampling which is the process in which um a woman would swab their own um cervical tissue for HPV has yeah. also encouraged women to be screened and reduce uh, personal discomfort, which is awesome. You're literally giving like people the autonomy yeah. to like control their health, which is phenomenal. But um, though these strategies are like really effective or have been shown to be really effective, enlisting the support uh, from respected leaders, so like, yeah, just community leaders and religious leaders in general, is mm -hmm. absolutely essential to fostering trust as well as educating these communities about the origins of cervical cancer and the efficacy of like vaccination programs and screenings. That was a whole lot of information. That was a whole I, lot of information. I was just gonna say my favorite part was the ability for women to do their own screenings. That's so empowering. Like, yeah. if I could just add on to that, like not even the fact that if you want to talk about, for example, trauma-informed care, mm -hmm. um, like you're giving women, like if someone might have had like an, um, an unfortunate experience with um, trigger warning, sexual assault, or mm -hmm. just anything like that from their partner or anyone else in their life, like you're giving yeah. women the, the ability to control like the whole screening process. Yeah. I mean, like at the end of the day, like if there is like the patient does have control in the screening process but you're literally saying like hey like we don't need to necessarily be involved with like touching or anything like that like mm -hmm. here are the tools here's how you do it you can do it and if you feel comfortable you can send us your sample and then you know you can get your results in like certain cultures like that's just a sort of way for them to feel dignified and yeah not feel uncomfortable yeah that's what healthcare is, giving people health and comfort and the ability to live their best life. Yeah, I love that. Like here in Canada, when we get past smears, like you have to go get them done with an individual. I'm not, I don't, from my knowledge, um, I don't think we have that option. I mean, I'm sure. I, think I feel you, like. I think we you? do. Yeah, I think you, you could. Do. Yeah, yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm so happy. Yeah. But you know, it's another thing we didn't necessarily address. Sorry, I don't want to change gears unless you haven't fine. finished your comment. But um, another thing, so we talked, at the beginning we spoke a little bit about it, but we talked a lot about like cisgendered women here. But um, another interesting disparity, I guess, that's really been overlooked is the LGBT community with incident incidences of HPV and cervical cancer and more particularly trans men. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a study actually done in 2015. It's called the United States or the U.S. Transgender Survey. So the USTS, it found that 71, so just to give like a little bit of context to it, um, it found that 71% of transgendered uh, men have received an androgen therapy. So, and 14% had a hysterectomy. So it's just saying that like, this mm -hmm. many people had like gender affirming surgery. Yeah. And um, this isn't like, and similar outcomes have been seen in like other high income countries. Yeah. However, um, it's basically saying like, despite like this many people have had gender affirming surgery, there's also the amount of people that haven't had the gender affirming surgery, meaning like they still have their like female reproductive yeah. organs and they still have a cervix. And because a lot of the times when you transition, uh, I, I can't speak for everyone because like, obviously I'm not a transgendered yeah. man, but based on like the study, it was saying that like a lot of the time when people transition towards being a transgendered man, they forget like certain, or they neglect rather certain aspects of their female identity. And from this though, by neglecting like certain aspects of maintaining like your health from things that you haven't necessarily fully trans like mm -hmm. transitioned yeah. away from yeah. you could like increase your chance of having um cervical cancer oh. so it was saying that um what's this over here sorry i'm just looking at the stats 
But yeah, it's just saying that like 20, 27% of transgender men, men who still had their cervix had a, a pap test in the last in the last year, which is compared to 43% of adult cisgender females in the United oh. States. So literally like double the amount uh, yeah. or half the amount of transgender men who still have their cervix are not being screened for um, or are being screened for the whatever cervical cancer in comparison yeah. to like cisgendered female populations are you saying that's more like of like a choice not like really a choice but they're like on their part or they're like not able to access these screenings yeah this from what the study said it didn't necessarily dive into too much about that but okay um, it from like a thing they also included a thing about like systemic and specific barriers that transgender men face when receiving cervical uh mm, screening yeah. tests yeah. and there's like a multitude of factors so it's a lack of education provided it's a lack of resources it's a lack of comfort that they feel around healthcare professionals mm-hmm. yeah it's like a multitude of factors that limit them or the amount of transgender yeah. men who have had cervical cancer screening tests yeah and yeah, there is a high pro- or a higher proportion of transgendered men in comparison to cisgendered females who have cervical cancer. Ooh, that's not good. Yeah. But yeah, the sad thing is, though, literally like half a century or more than half a century of groundbreaking discoveries has literally provided all of humanity yeah. the tools needed to eliminate HPV infection and cervical cancer. And, but the thing is, like, the now, now the challenge lies in distributing these resources fairly and equitably, not just to, like, high-income countries, but low-income yeah. countries, and everyone in between. It's like the science is there. The science has given us the answers, but now we have to find the answers for these social disparities and all that stuff. Yeah, and that isn't possible without the support from governments yeah. and non-governmental organizations, mm-hmm. healthcare workers, community members, families, like, everyone everybody yeah we all play a part like I know we said this episode is for like cisgender female and transgender male but you know everyone like this is a podcast that everyone should listen to and like educate yourself and support those around you Mm -hmm. because yeah HPV and cervical cancer is one of those things where it is preventable at Mm -hmm. this point like people don't need to die anymore from these diseases because yeah like there are tools that are nearly a hundred percent effective. Yeah. But so, yeah, it's just making sure that healthcare or doing our best to make sure healthcare is equitable and freely distributed around the world. Yeah. I was going to add like for pap smears and stuff, like it might not be well known, like at least for me, oh, yeah. I wasn't quite familiar with like, when do I get one? How do I like whatever and stuff. So I was doing some research and what I came across was essentially you should start getting a pap smear by the age of 21. And from the ages of 21 to 29, you should be getting a pap smear every three years. Once you're over the age of 30 and you haven't had any abnormal pap smears, then you can have a pap smear. You should get a pap smear every five years and you should be getting tested until like the age of 65 or so. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just sorry. I'm just reading the uh, government of Ontario's website about mm-hmm. um, like cervical cervical cancer testing and uh, prevention. Here, yeah, we'll also include this link in the um, description, obviously. Yeah, but yeah, thank you for sharing that, Janani. Yeah, Pap smears are also covered by OHIP. So to our pals in Ontario, go get them done. It's so fun. We can all go together. <laughs> all at once. <laughs> all at once. <laughs> we'll make it a nice little trip post-COVID. Yeah. I mean, you can still get it done during COVID, by the way. So. Yeah. Anyways, but unless, Janine, you have any more that you want to contribute. No, that is all. So everyone, do your part. Get a pap test. See if you can get a pap test. Can you? Stay wait? healthy, friends. Yeah. All righty. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you, everyone, for watching. That wraps up this week's episode. Goodbye. Bye.